wants to be 70 years. Eight years.
a lot of people today are thinking that when the Voyager spacecraft in August gets to the planet Neptune, you know what we think we'll probably find? Yeah. Rings around it because the other three gases planet has rings around it. So we're just assuming that it does too. Remember I talked to you about the big red spot? There's a picture of it. That's it, by the way. Oh, the rings are out. Okay. Any picture made up of dust particles and sand or not? Yes. There's actually three red spots. So that they would be able to determine what we look like. Now, you guys are all laughing because those people didn't have any clothes on, right? I'll admit it. That's what you were laughing about. But you see, if there are strange beings out there in space, if they saw us all dressed up and all, they wouldn't know what we actually look like, would they? All they would know is what we try to look like. Now think about that. Okay. Pioneer 10. All of us, it must have been about five or six summers ago, on June the 13th, it, it left the Earth. It is now out of our solar system, traveling through what we call the space race track. Your textbooks today, boys and girls, tells you that Saturn has at least 11 rings around it. We know today that it has at least a thousand. We cannot even count all of these. There are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rings in us. It's the planet that we knew that had rings around it even from years because we were able to look at it through the telescope and see it. But, uh, you notice these little blank spots here in the pictures now? That's actually uh, uh, what happens is if there are some moons floating in this area and it messes up some of the rings on it and causes some breaks in them out. They call the spoke effect, this field of light, so to speak, that it would float. Yeah, it would float. These are, these are some of the other ones too. Okay. Notice they have kind of some strange names though. These are all selected by astronomers and different people though. Remember we talked about Phobos while ago? He was parents and we put the collection up in 76. And it was a unique collection. 20 years ago I was planning on getting cancer on a wall for seven years. And right now we're working the United Nations for the past nine years has been issuing stamps for the flat countries of the world. And our Cover this year, it says that uh, taken to the moon were the United States flag, the flag of 50 states, the District of Columbia, the U.S. territories, the United Nations flag, and as well as those of 136 foreign countries. At the time in 1969, the United Nations had 136 members. So next year, we're going to have United Nations flags on display. There's not a person on the planet Earth that can come to the Armstrong Museum and not see his flag displayed on the, in the Armstrong Museum. Because they are we'll talk to you, and uh, uh, we appreciate the time you spent with us. Maybe you'll come back and talk to us. Hi. Well, let me let me get a little further and teach you about orbiting here. Okay. Well, let me let me get a rifle out. Get a nice rifle out. Dad's hunting rifle or something. And if I fire a bullet out of that rifle, I go bang. The bullet leaves the barrel of the rifle. What's going to happen to that bullet when, once it leaves the barrel? I don't, that's not exactly correct. Get it from out of the barrel and start to fall. It's gonna, as soon as it leaves the barrel, it's going to start to fall. Okay, that is if the barrel is in right, but we will get into that. Okay, so as soon as that bullet leaves the barrel, it's going in that direction, if I fire the gun in that direction, at some number of miles per hour. It's traveling very fast. So, if you think about it, the barrel is what's holding up the bullet. Okay? When I fire the gun and the bullet leaves the barrel, and I go bang, and I go bang, if I drop a penny at the same time as I go bang, or at the same time the bullet leaves the barrel, bang, a penny hits the ground at the exact same time, somewhere down there the bullet hits the ground. Okay? Then it would fall over the side of the earth. So fuel would stay in orbit unless you start to fall back in and slow down for some reason. Thank you. At any rate, well, what we're doing here is we're boosting the space shuttle into orbit, getting it high enough and fast enough so that it falls. I'm being there. I need to, to do my training and to do my homework and uh, support the missions that come along. And by capacity, that's sort of what I'm doing. And uh, when my turn comes along, I'll, I'll be ready. Major President Bush's uh, goal to the Mars, the moon base is online. I laud President Bush's uh, proposals uh, to uh, build a space station, establish a moon colony or a moon, moon base, and then go on to Mars. Uh, 
I think this nation needs a goal. We haven't had one in 30 years, and it's about time uh, the president took some uh, leadership and, and actually stated some goals. Hopefully the country will support him and follow and will follow and get those goals done. Of course, Neil Armstrong is from Walpock Med. Do you think any of these kids someday out of possibility? I would end up going up? If, there's, if there's enough motivation, uh, I would think so. I never thought I'd be in the shoes I'm in right now, so yeah, and there you go. Okay, my, my background is, is the forte that, that my background is for the space program is my technical background in science and mathematics. And the oceanography is, is just a specialty that it's kind of on the shelf at the moment uh, because of my training. The, the, the technical background that I have in math and physics allows me to understand uh, the workings of the shuttle, the, the guidance, and so on. Uh, the oceanography, as I showed some pictures you might have been here for, there are uh, aspects of oceanography and meteorology that you can apply in terms of observing the Earth from the shuttle, and I hope to uh, use that when I do get a flight to, uh, to better observe uh, or document some of the uh, Earth-bound problems that we have in those regards. What advice would you have to kids uh, in, in this room today who, who want to be astronauts? What do you think they should be doing? I think they should uh, study well in school and get their homework done. Absolutely. I know they don't like to hear that, but uh, it's going to take that kind of work if they want to be astronauts or if they want to do anything. If they want to be an engineer, a doctor, uh, or, or anything productive in life, they're going to have to do their homework and you can study real well. That's the bottom line. In 1957. Were you in the military before? I am. No, I'm a Navy oceanographer. Uh, yes, I am. I'm still in the military. Duty Navy. Well, that's when the space programs, both the, the U.S. and the Russians, got off the ground, and I was just enthralled with it all, and I said that's what I wanted to do. What do you think about? Excuse me. What do you think about Armstrong walking the moon when you were a kid? I was. I was. Uh, matter of fact, that particular day, I, I had asked my girlfriend to go steady, and I was 17, and she turned me down, and. And uh, it kind of was, as you might have expected for a 17-year-old, to be a little bit depressed or upset about that. But later that day, Neil stepped foot on the moon, and it all didn't matter after that. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. You're welcome. Mario, I have to say, yeah. right now, it was Take wonderful. Care. See, nice meeting you. Thank you. Did you know right? I have to get my hair done. OK. That's important. We thought this one. And I just uh, send you, I guess, we'll take you to Sure, please. Yeah. What's the address? Uh, 77058 at the Johnson Space Center. 058. 058, you got it. Code CD is the information. It's so wonderful to be with you. Charlie Brown. Instead of Charlie, I can burn the Charlie Brown. Okay. Close enough, Nick. I see you. That slide you showed uh, where you, you said this was Neil Armstrong coming down the ladder, right. you, you said it was taken by a video camera? I think they took adapted a, a slide from that. I'm not sure. i got to do a little research on that. But I believe my records show that it's Armstrong, at least as I have it. If it's Armstrong, it's from a TV camera. It's from a TV camera because they never were any... have to be going up. I mean... No, no, no. no because no, no. when our Neil, Neil, there was a camera outside. There was a camera that swung down from, from one of the legs of the limb. Mm -hmm. And then that, that's what took the picture when he came down. Right. But then he would have had to put one. I mean, that looked like it was out further. I'm not sure. The tech, that's what I have on my record. It might not be. It may be an inaccuracy. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, it, it might be. It might be that they were both pictures of uh, I, I wouldn't swear to that. Thank you. Mario. Yes. What training did you take? Now I'm in training right now, I'm learning about shuttle systems and uh, how to operate, fly, and all the and and, and and work the shuttle in the event of malfunctions. Prior to that, I'm a Navy oceanographer and meteorologist, and I've been in the Navy for the last 12 years. I'm a mission specialist astronaut as opposed to a pilot astronaut who would who would have been flying high-performance aircraft, fighter jets, and the like. That's what, another way to become What course do you go through? Course now or before? Now. Now, I'm, like I said, I'm studying and learning about the shuttle and, uh, and all the systems that uh, require the education and the math and science I've already got behind me. So it's applying that to the to the shuttle today. Does that answer your question? Okay. How did you become an astronaut? <laughs> when? When I, I became an astronaut two years ago in August of '87, and I started applying in 1979, and applied every year uh, that they had a selection and, uh, until I got How an interview. How many did they select? And and got selected. Yeah. How many did they select? 
there were 15 the last class, and that was uh, the final screening process. There were 1,962, about 2,000 people. That's not to include what uh, the military then screened out that sent their names in the hat down to NASA. Okay. Right. You're welcome. Thank you. Let me collect my Serve a nice thing. Oh, you got a right, Mario? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Thanks for coming. Nice to see you. Serve a good day. Nice to meet you. Do you have a regard to tomorrow? Yes, I'd like to because I brought everything back uh, by oh, air and the airlines lost it all. Ah. We have we have, have all of the we have all the emission patches. Skylab too. Yes, we all have okay. all we have all the Skylab ones. Because I would have the same. They're the, you basically the same patches. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, they're all. I don't know I was, if there's one or two well, manufacturers. Actually, I was, yeah, I was there's just I, we know of two manufacturers. Okay. We yeah. have all the new shuttle missions too. What? The newest ones. Yeah. Josh, I just want to say to you and the young astronauts that uh, it truly is an honor to be here at the Neil Armstrong Museum. And I think if you young astronauts have dreams, stick with the dreams, believe in them, and don't let anyone sidetrack you. And what you see before you is a dream by John F. Kennedy, and America picked up the dream and ran with it. And uh, thank you for your interest, and thank you for your coverage. Good luck.
welcome you here on this fine warm day. This is a very special day because we are celebrating and commemorating a great event in the history of America. This is the 20th year since Neil Armstrong, Wapakoneta's hometown boy, set foot on the moon back in July. Perhaps you can remember what you were doing when you saw it live. A very, very great event and we are happy to be here. Ladies and gentlemen, as is our custom right now, would you please join us as we honor our country by playing our national anthem. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you to a demonstration of one of the world's largest and fastest growing sport hobbies, that of radio control. The Spirit of America Air Show Team has put together a performance that we hope will bring you a better understanding of radio control model aviation, and at the same time, mixed with a little slapstick comedy and humor and some very unusual aircraft, will give you an afternoon of entertainment the whole family is going to enjoy. This talented group of gentlemen behind me represents about 300 years of RC experience. Each man here was chosen for the team for his ability as an RC pilot, craftsman, and other outstanding contributions to the RC sport. Our team's been featured on national television on You Ask For It and also on PM Magazine. We're internationally known. We've done shows all the way from Canada down to Lake Charles, Louisiana, from Illinois, and across Pennsylvania, and of course, around Ohio and Michigan. We're an official air show team sanctioned through the Academy of Modeling Aeronautics out of Ruston, Virginia. We're known as team number 109, and we're now in our 13th season. Let me introduce these talented gentlemen to you, starting with myself, 
I'm Duke Guyton. I'm from Lyme, Ohio, and I'm self-employed as a painter. Let me look around here because I've got to look at these people. They slipped a lot of new faces in on me, some folks that haven't been around for a while. Let's welcome, first of all, from Holland, Michigan, where he's a computer draftsman, Mr. James Lassick. And if you notice a slight family resemblance from Columbus, Ohio, we have Tommy Lassick, son of James. He's part of the Races Management for the Apartment Association in Columbus. And from Finley, Ohio, where he's employed by Ball Metal, Mr. Phil Brown. Honorary Pass Manager from Finley, Ohio, where he's employed by Cooper Tire and Rubber Company.
right here.